Hi there, my name is Nemo, this is my channel Has Planty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So for today's video, and I have done a video about this in the past, but I thought I'd do a bit more of a comprehensive guide, I want to talk about pests. And I can see people twitching, I can imagine people twitching as they're watching this video, but hopefully this will cover a lot of the pests that you might experience in a household environment. And let me just give you a bit of an explanation of how I'm going to split this up. I'm going to do some general info and some kind of my top tips before we look at specific pests individually and talk about what I have found has worked for some of these things. And also I'll talk about some of the methods that maybe I've tried and haven't worked or that I'm aware of generally. So I've got my list in front of me. I will be referring to it throughout the video, but hopefully I'll bring up things to show you as well. First thing I was going to say is, especially if you're new to this, don't panic. Even if you've been at this for a while, I still know people two, three years down the line, they still panic. I know it's easy for me to say don't panic, but the longer you do this, the more you realize that pests happen Pests happen at different stages of the year as well, and pests will continue to happen because if you think about it, these plants, when they're out in nature, which is obviously their natural habitat, there would be other bugs there to deal with some of these pests. And also there is a matter of kind of evolutionary aspect as well. So if, if a plant gets decimated by a pest in a specific area, other, it might develop genetic ways to deal with it, or it might just not work in that area and it could grow somewhere else basically. But as I said, don't panic, pests will happen and pests will still happen. That's the other big thing as well. Sorry to burst your bubble slightly with this one. You will never fully get rid of pests, if that makes sense. And by that, I mean, you can get to a point where you've managed them down to the point where you can't see them or truly they are gone for that period of time but fast forward a few months or maybe even a year and some of the pests might be back, you might get different pests, it's fine. It's part of owning houseplants. And if you are worried enough to be stressed about it, you will probably deal with them in an efficient way that your plant probably won't perish, if that makes sense. You hear a lot of horror stories when it comes to pests, but at least in my experience, nine times out of 10, the reason why somebody may have lost a plant to pests is because they did not realize it early enough. And basically the pests had got so prolific on that one specific plant that it might not be salvageable anymore. And that's probably one of my first top tips is every time you water, check. Just quickly turn over some leaves, just do a visual check as you're watering something. You're there already, it won't take you any longer and just check if you're seeing any pests on it. The other thing that I wanted to say is that no advice, even the one that I'm going to give on this video is absolute because everybody's environment is going to be different. Everybody's financial situation might be different. Everybody's time that they can dedicate to dealing with pests is going to be different. So don't let it affect you too, too much. For instance, I'm thinking of a very specific example Everybody says for most pests, if you see a pest, quarantine the plant. Can you see the level of plants behind me? It's very difficult for me to quarantine a plant. And all that that means is if I leave the plant in situ, I just really need to be hyper aware of what's around it, make sure that it's not touching anything. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But you can still deal with pests even without quarantining them. It just might take a bit of time, a bit longer and you might not fully get rid of them entirely, but there is a point, and I'm not gonna lie to you, and people that have seen my channel, my videos for a while, I've had different pests at different times and I'm dealing with different pests at different times. It's just standard with having houseplants, essentially. The other thing I was gonna say, and this I can actually bring up some examples, is if you want to get a few bits and bobs to deal with pests, and I'm talking more, less liquids, and I'll come on to liquids when we talk about individual pests, but more kind of tools. 
and you don't have to get this. If your financial situation doesn't allow you to get this, you don't have to do this. There's other ways around not using some of these materials, basically. So first thing is get something like a spray bottle. And the one thing I will say about these types of spray bottles with the trigger is just have a look online and see other videos from people as well. I actually found this specific one from Amazon from a suggestion from another YouTuber because the trigger doesn't get too tiring after a while and it's a kind of a robust sprayer. It's a bit more expensive. And again, I'm gonna talk about English prices here. If an average cheapish sprayer on Amazon might be three or four pounds, this was I think eight or nine. But to be fair, it's lasted a good four years and it's a comfortable one. But generally with this one, you can get a bit tired depending on how much you need to spray your plants. I do have a better option. Again, it's a similar price point as well. So it is a tiny bit more expensive. As I said, you don't have to get any of these. Something like these types of sprayers, which are meant for the garden, because what you can do is you can put the liquid in here, you can pump it up. It basically creates a different pressure in the sprayer itself. And then you've got a trigger that you can either pull down and hold down, which is easier than having to like trigger pull all the time. Or this one also has a little knob that you can kind of touch down and it will keep it down. And all you need to do is just spray then. You don't even need to hold it down. Much, much better in my opinion, especially if you've got a larger collection. If you've only got to have a couple of plants, this probably isn't worth the investment. You can probably go with something like a trigger spray. Even if you don't, and this is the point, if you can't afford any of this, what you can do is reuse. So something like a spray um, cleaner. Obviously make sure that you're rinsing it out properly and you're cleaning it from all the chemicals. And I would still say leave it for a day and then do the rinse again and leave it for a bit longer just to make sure that all of those chemicals have come out. And then just use that as a, as a spray to put whatever liquids it is that you need to deal with the different pests. The other thing I was gonna mention, and this is a really cool thing that I learned from Jane Perrone and her podcast on the Lead Podcast. I was recently on the podcast as well, so if you wanna hear that, that's I'm gonna have that in the description down below. But something like this, which essentially is a jeweler's loop, I think it's called. It's just a fancy way of saying it's a bit of a magnifying glass. And this one specifically that I got on Amazon, has also got, and you might be able to see if I bring it in a bit closer, yeah. It has also got a battery in it and it's got a bit of a light so it will shine onto whatever you're trying to see basically. You could also use just a regular magnifying glass if you've got one hanging around somewhere and if you don't wanna spend any money and you've got a phone and it's got a vaguely decent camera, you can just point your camera at the device itself, me trying to not drop the jeweler's loop as I've just replaced it because my other one after four years had finally died. But <laughs> you can use your phone camera and zoom in that way. You might have to play around with that a bit, but it's a free way of kind of getting a very, very similar effect. But this is really good because I cannot tell you how many times, even when I was starting off, and I know a lot of other people, they're just like, I think I've got pests. This will kind of make your life a bit easier when you're trying to figure out if you actually do have pests. But the other thing is something that I can't show you because it's dotted around the conservatory, circulation. And for the people that have seen my conservatory tour, you were able to see quite a lot of fans around. Now, the fans serve multiple purposes. One, they get the air circulating around the room. It also means that sometimes the soil media might dry out a bit faster, so there's less of a chance of root rot. I mean, there's, these are not absolutes here, but it helps a bit with that. It also moves the plants around a bit, so it means their roots become a lot more stable because they have to keep themselves upright, which is very similar to what would happen in nature. Obviously, I'm not talking about gale force winds out of a fan. Use your judgment there but also the circulation, the air circulation, makes it a bit harder for certain types of pests who might fly, for instance, to be able to kind of infect other plants because it makes it very difficult for them, if the, even if there's the smallest bit of a breeze, for them to fly to a neighboring plant, especially if they've got wings. So that's the other thing as well. And sometimes I find depending on the, the, the level of strength of that wind, and again, no gale force winds wherever you've got your plants, but it can also mean that pests that are kind of on certain foliage and things like that might not be able to quite attach quite as well. So that's another little thing that you could do. And it's always a good thing to generally have some air circulation going. 
especially in an environment like this where the humidity is quite high and I'm thinking a lot of the kind of greenhouse cabinets from Ikea where a lot of people have. I think most people are aware and they're putting fans in there, but there's a good reason for that. If you don't put a fan and it's high humidity all the time, you will get things like mildew and other kind of more fungal types of infection because that air circulation kind of prevents them a bit from occurring. It doesn't stop them altogether, but it does prevent them a bit from occurring. So air circulation is a big thing. The other thing to bear in mind is proximity. So this is something that some people talk about and it's the fact that if you've got a lot of plants that are touching close to each other, it's a lot easier for certain types of pests to move between the plants. It creates a bit of a pathway to move from one plant to the other plant and then they can spread quite easily that way. This is a lot of the times why people say quarantine your plants because if you have it far away from something else even if it's a flying pest and there are certain ones that can still get around rooms and I'll get to that at the very end but um, you want to make that as difficult for them to move over as possible. As I said I can't I don't always have the luxury of being able to quarantine plants in my space because I've got so many and they're all over the place but Something to bear in mind that if things are really close to each other, mainly for the crawling type pests rather than the flying type pests, because the flying type pests could fly somewhere even if they're not close to each other. So just bear in mind, even if you just create a bit of a gap, that's fine. Another thing to bear in mind is the speed that these things happen. Even if you look at some of these pests, they don't move, a lot of them don't move that fast. So just because your pet, your plants are touching today, and they might be for two or three days, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden every single one of your plants is going to get infected because they are rushing across all the different plants. It takes a while for them to kind of move around between plants. I mean, still bear, bear that in mind, but don't panic too much that you need to do it right now. If it needs to happen in a couple of hours or a day, that's still going to be okay. Then you need to think about things like seasons. And now seasons, obviously, we're at least in the kind of northern hemisphere, we're coming into spring summer now which means it's pest season galore and it means that most pests are really happy because they need certain temperatures to survive. However there's a, a bit of a fallacy when people say that obviously spring summer is the main time for the pests that people assume when they're first starting off that you're not going to get any pests in the winter or the autumn time. Guess what they still happen because these plants and their pests that are on them are not outside where it's cold cold they're inside where it's a bit warmer. So you can still get some pests, not all of them, and we can touch on these as we look at the pests individually. But yeah, you'll still probably get some type of pest potentially, even in the months when you're not expecting them. And the other big thing I want to just kind of wrap up this intro section, I'm very aware that this is kind of a very long intro section, but hopefully these are more generic tips and tricks. And this is probably going to be a long video just to warn you. The other thing you need to bear in mind is things like tendencies of certain plants. And I do mention this in my review series specifically about each plant that I review. And I'll put a link up at the top there so if you haven't seen the review series you can check it out. But essentially there are certain plants, both species and genuses, that tend to have more of a propensity to a certain type of pest. And the easiest example that I can think of is things like alocasias spider mites love them basically. So one of these things that people always kind of sit there thinking is I'm doing something right, I've never got a spider mite on my alocasia, it's never going to happen. A better way to maybe think about that is I've not had a spider mite on my alocasia yet and it might happen at some point in the future because generally speaking spider mites will like alocasias. But again there's a lot of people when they speak about specific plants they will generally talk about certain pest pressures at least that they've experienced and there's usually a bit of consistency around there. Another one that I'm thinking of going really really specific is the philodendron varicosum and spider mites. Ah, it's a spider mite magnet but yeah and things like hoyas have got more of a propensity to have mealybugs because they've got all the nooks and crannies where they like to hide so things like that just it's a good idea when you're first getting a plant have a look at what types of pests you might be expecting to see on that plant and just keep an eye out for them as well. Keep an eye out for most pests on most plants but specific ones if you know that there's people that are specifically talking that this plant 
has a predisposition to have this type of pest, obviously keep your eye out for those types of pests. But yeah, I think that's the general bit that I wanted to talk about. Let's dive into individual pests and the order that I'm going to do this in and hopefully I'll add some chapters to the bottom of this very long video, which I'm envisioning is going to be quite a long video. I'll talk about fungus gnats first and fungus gnats are the things that look a bit like um, fruit flies that people always confuse them with fruit flies. They are slightly different beasts essentially. Uh, then I'll talk about spider mites, mealybugs, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to say about mealybugs could also apply to scale. I have never, touch wood, yet experienced scale, so I don't know from personal experience what would work particularly well for it. If you do have experience with scale and you want to share your experiences with what you do and what has worked for you, drop it down below. Then I will talk about things like white flies, and I don't think a lot of people go into too much detail with white fly, but I'm struggling at the moment with white fly in my environment, so I can talk a bit more about that at the moment. And then I'll finish off with everybody's worst pest, thrips. But yeah, let's dive into the first one. So moving on to fungus gnats, and as I've mentioned at the beginning of the video, this is the one pest that people kind of wrongfully call a fruit fly. It's not really a fruit fly, it is a fungus gnat, it is slightly different. Again, have a look on Google, Google is free, and you'll see that there is a bit of a difference between what these pests look like. Now, what happens with the fungus gnats is they will live in the top few centimeters of soil and generally tends to be from soil. I've not really had a lot of problems with fungus gnats with any of the plants that I've moved into pond. I think it's the same for Lekka, even ones with water reservoirs. I don't tend to find that they get fungus gnats as often. Not entirely impossible, I don't think, but as often. So bear in mind that they will live in that top few centimeters of the soil, and that's usually where they will lay their eggs. The thing that you might see about them is they will fly in your face and they will fly up your nose. It's because they're attracted to the warmth that's why, and they can be quite irritating. The thing to remember about fungus gnats, however, is yes, some of the larvae, some of the kind of eggs that are in the soil could slightly damage the roots. And I've had a big infestation of fungus gnats when I was first starting off and I didn't know how to treat them, but it never really caused too much of an issue with most of my plants. So generally speaking, fungus gnats are more annoying to us than they are problematic to the plant. So bear that in mind as well. But again, I know that it, it can be irritating for people. That's why I'm including them in here. And I'm holding a jar of something that's empty. This was actually a mealybug killer, but the um, one of the methods that I want to talk about comes in very similar jars, at least it has come in my experience, and that is nematodes, so beneficial nematodes. And essentially it looks a bit like wet uh, cornstarch or corn flour, basically. And it's, it's a really interesting kind of texture and there's loads of these little beneficial nematodes and I think under a microscope, if I'm not mistaken, they look like little worms. And eventually what they do, especially with the eggs and the larva of the fungus gnats that are in the soil, they act like little worms. They go into these developing pests and they eat them from the inside out. So it, it's a bit gruesome. But it does work like a charm, basically, because essentially what it's doing is it's controlling it before the fungus gnats even emerge as adults. The thing that you will need to do with this is when you get these, and you can order them online, it does, at least in my experience, it's said that you can keep it in the refrigerator for a day or two if you don't want to do it immediately. I would generally say I've had better results when I've used it immediately rather than storing it for a few days because those beneficial nematodes might die off before you've even had a chance to apply them and then you'll be wondering why it hasn't worked. The other thing is a piece of advice. With beneficial nematodes, I found that it can take a few weeks before you start seeing the results. And again, that links back to what I was talking about in the beginning of the video, which is life cycle of the pests. So give it time. In my experience, at least, I have seen that it could take between two to four weeks before I completely stop noticing fungus gnats buzzing around. And what I used to do when I had more plants in soil is I used to do a preemptive strike with nematodes at the beginning of the spring season. So anything that was just about to hatch out and start 
pestering me for the warmer months would get dealt with quite early. So something to bear in mind. The other thing to bear in mind with this, and this is something that you will generally see a lot of people using is, and I'm not going to unstick the, the backing of this, but this is, believe me, you can see the yellow. These are yellow sticky traps and you can buy them on Amazon, you can buy them in most places where you just stick it in the soil media and take off obviously the protective bit. Be warned, they are exceptionally sticky as the name would suggest, but they will stick to everything including you and anything you get anywhere near them basically. So, <laughs> but this will capture the adult flying fungus gnats because the smaller kind of more larval and egg stage, obviously they're in the soil or they're around the soil, they don't fly when they get to adulthood is when they start flying. So this will get the adults because if you've put the beneficial nematodes into the soil, what will then happen is it will kill off the babies. But if you've still got other adults, they could also be creating more babies and putting in. Obviously, the nematodes might still be around and they might still kill it, but it's a good thing to do both. One of the other things that a lot of people have suggested, I have not tried it because ironically enough, I used to get this problem on plants that couldn't afford to dry out too, too much. And I think my worst offenders for fungus gnats were most of my prayer plants, the calatheas, the tenanthes, the stromanthes, the marantas. They were the ones that were really used to getting it. So I found that if I let the soil dry out entirely in order to kill off the eggs because they need that moisture in the soil, that would also cause harm to the plants. So a bit of a catch-22 situation there. So bear that in mind. If you can do it and it's a plant that you know could take it drying out a bit, so I'm thinking a lot of monsteras, they can kind of handle being dried out fully, that should be fine and that should probably kill them off relatively quickly. But again, if you've got a lot of them buzzing around and you've got loads of plants, the adults could then go and lay eggs again when you've watered in. But if you have a bit more of a dry cycle every time, it could kill off the eggs every time. But that is another kind of free way of dealing with them, essentially. One of the other things that I, again, have not tried is something called diatomaceous earth. And this is kind of like a powder, kind of crystalline structure, uh, at least from what I've seen. And think of it almost like kind of minuscule shards of glass and you put them over the top of the soil. So when the larva, the kind of not larva emerge from the soil to go into kind of the top of the soil and eventually mature into adulthood, it basically rips them up. So it does kind of deal with them in that way. As I said, I've not tried it. I know some people have had good success with this, but I just, I haven't had a chance to use it. If you have used diatomaceous earth and you've got some of your own experiences that you want to share, do drop a comment down below. I'm sure a lot of the people watching this would love to know this. And then a fun way of dealing with fungus gnats, and I'll try to lift this up because it's dripping and it's in a lure pack container because that's where I'm keeping the water in. You can use something like, and let me see if it will focus. Yes, it will. This is a carnivorous plant, and this is a pingicula, a pinguicula, uh, also sometimes shortened down to a ping. And you can get them, they're really, really cool. They almost act a bit like a sticky trap. So again, this will only really deal with the adults, but they get slight fuzziness on the leaves. There's a slight bit of sticky material. So when fungus gnats will go anywhere and buzz around this, they will then stick to the leaves and obviously nourish the carnivorous plant, which is kind of cool. Uh, you can also get different ones. This is one that I found will also, and I'll see if I can bring it up so you might be able to see, there's a tiny bit of blushing that's happening. Ignore the dryness, but this is not a plant that I keep because it's particularly pretty. It can be, but it's mainly because I want it to be utilitarian and deal with things like fungus gnats if they occur. But the other one that you can use, and I don't have one in at the moment, is a Drosera, and I do think I've got some pictures, so I should be able to add a picture here. It's got little kind of sticky droplets on its leaves, and then when a bug touches it, eventually it will wrap it up. That is less efficient at dealing with fungus gnats than this is, basically. The one that you really don't want to use is the Venus flytrap, ironically enough. Venus flytraps are better at capturing bigger prey I think I found in my experience, and I think from what I'm talking to other people, it, the fungus gnats aren't chunky or big enough in order to trigger the traps to close and capture them in. So it isn't one. If you've got regular house flies, do obviously get something like um, a Venus flytrap if you want to see it kind of munch away at the bugs. I, don't, I know it doesn't munch. I know that it dissolves it from the inside, but 
let me let me just imagine that because I'm weird. <laughs> but pingiculars are possibly one of the best things you can do. And um, if you've got a few of these, they're not sometimes they're not that expensive. You can get a few of these, and you can kind of dot them around some of your plants that you know have got fungus gnats, and they will do the work for you. And you've got another plant as well. The thing I will say about pingiculas is very similar to certain kind of rosette forming succulents I found, they will pup. So if you get a few of them, you might have even more by the next year because they might have pupped more plantlets and you can move them into their own uh, growing media, which is obviously different, but I'm not going to go into this as different than most house plants. But uh, you can then move those pups, those little new pingiculas around. So kind of cool. And just to summarize this section again, for me, Beneficial nematodes were the one thing that worked really, really well. And obviously use them in collaboration with the sticky traps for the adults and be aware of the life cycle of this specific pest because you're going to have to um, deal with certain things over and over again. The one thing I haven't mentioned, but I will do an honorable mention now, is something that I know is available in the States. I'm pretty sure you can't find it in the UK. I would imagine it's probably the same in Europe. And if the once or twice that I found it, it is obscenely expensive, is something called mosquito bits or mosquito dunks, where you put something in the water and it, it kind of kills off the fungus gnats. As I said, I don't know an awful lot about it because I can't really get it over here. Again, as always, if you've got experience with mosquito bits or mosquito dunks, drop it in the comments down below. I'm sure other people would like to know, especially if they can get a hold of that in their environment is spider mites and this is i would say arguably probably one of the most common with maybe the exception of the fungus gnats one of the most common house plants at least in my experience that i think most people will experience at some point or another so there are several things that you can do and i'm looking down at my notes again i will start off with the thing that has worked the best for me and i'll give you all the other ways that you could treat them and I'll explain kind of what my experience has been with them. But for me, the best way of dealing with them, and it's probably not going to focus too, too much, but you can get satchels of predatory mites. And these are things that look like the spider mites, but they actually eat the spider mites, but don't harm your plant. So these are really, really good. And you can get them in two forms as well. And I'll see if I can add a link to one of my favorite places, at least in the UK, for biological control, because these are all things that are called biological control. You're using the natural potential predators of these pests from the wild and introducing them in your house. And I know it might make a few people squeamish, but a lot of us that have been doing this for a while, a lot of us have kind of moved on to biological control because it's a, a bit more hands off, basically. But with these you can either get the satchels and the satchels you'll put on as a bit of a preventative it's usually not when you have a huge infestation and what it will do it will release spider mites at the first sign sorry spider mite predators at the first signs of spider mites if you've got a full-blown infestation you can get the other version of this which is a jar of spider mites and it's kind of a bit of a shaker and you shake it onto the plant so you're delivering those predatory mites directly where the spider mite infestation is basically. So really, really cool. The one thing I will say, and this applies to all biological control, if you're using any form of spray, whether it's organic or whether or not it's systemic to deal with pests, you need to give some time since the last time you sprayed your plants for any pest before you introduce biological control, because guess what? A lot of the other kind of the, either the, organic kind of pest spray or the systemic pest spray, it doesn't distinguish between the good ones and the bad ones. So it will kill the good ones as well. And it's a shame because sometimes biological control can be a bit pricey. So bear that in mind, give it some time. I would say in my experience for biological control, two to three weeks after kind of spraying, after the last spray down is probably gonna be safe. Systemic, I would say leave it for at least four weeks before you introduce the biological control. The other thing that you might want to do is either through a sprayer and we can use either one of the sprayers that I talked in the very beginning or by taking it out in the garden. If you've got a garden and you've got a garden hose with kind of a spray attachment that has a bit of a shower head 
or take it in the shower and just literally spray it down the entire plant, the stems, the leaves on the back, usually they like to sit in the nooks and crannies, and the front, spray it all the way down and it will flush out that kind of strong jet of water will kind of knock out most of the spider mites off the plant as well. The thing to remember with that is obviously if you've got soil and you've just watered you might want to cover the soil so you don't get that wet again and then you've got an issue with root rot but yeah I mean it's spraying down the leaves will knock out most of these uh, pests. Again touching on susceptibility of plants we talked about things like alocasias are more susceptible, uh, the philodendron varicosum is more susceptible. Have a look at what plants are more susceptible to spider mites. Not all of my plants have got spider mites at one point or another. Some of them do and they will get it consistently so I will keep checking out for them. All, always 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 and this is where it really does come into its own something like a jeweler's loop or the camera on your phone or a magnifying glass will really come in quite handy because out of a lot of the pests the spider mites are usually quite difficult to spot at least at the early stages. But when you do have a little magnifying glass, and I don't know whether or not I've got a video or a picture that I can put here, if I have, I will. I'm sure if you did a YouTube search, if I don't find a video, you could probably find one. But uh, they do look like little, little tiny uh, spiders, but they're mites obviously. So things like a magnifying glass or your camera will do wonders of being able to really magnify that on because sometimes you might get things like fluff or perlite dust on the leaves and you might panic that it's spider mites and it's not, it's just dust. But double check basically. <laughs> the other thing to bear in mind when it comes to spider mites, and at least this has been my experience, and I'll use the alocasias as an example, they tend to happen more when there's been some inconsistency with the watering. Maybe the alocasia has gone dry for a bit too long. So generally speaking, spider mites don't like things that are particularly wet, especially if there's a high level of humidity. If you've got your plants in a very high level of humidity, not always, but a lot of the times you probably won't see spider mites. Spider mites will thrive in a slightly warmer and drier environment. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, spider mites are one of those things that you might also see in the winter and autumn when you're not expecting to see pests and the reason for that is because if you've got them in a regular household environment and you've got your heaters going at any given time it's drying out the air and it's also warm enough for the spider mites so it's a good environment for them to kind of attack your plants. Right the next big thing for spider mites and I'll bring it up and it's not particularly exciting, I'm showing you liquids in this video, apologies, but you can use neem oil. So a neem oil solution, and it's not for everybody, I'm not going to lie, this is something that really doesn't smell particularly nice, so just bear that in mind because it's going to linger for a few hours or days in your house, so your roommates, housemates, significant others or friends and family might not like this smell, and neither might you, but what you would normally do and this is the other thing that you're going to need in collaboration with that is you need to dilute these things in water and then use something like a sprayer or this type of sprayer as well but what you would do is you would fill up whatever sprayer you're using with warm water not hot water warm water then you would add some soap some liquid soap do if you can and this is something that I've only just recently started doing, don't use washing up liquid that you would do. So um, here in the UK, one of the biggest ones is something like Fairy Liquid. Um, I think in the States it's called Dawn Dish Soap. I might be wrong. Those are actually, and this is only something I learned recently, those are actually more detergents based and they're not soaps. Something like a Castile soap is a soap. Or if you want to spend a bit more money, you can find in garden centers and online, you can find horticultural soap or soap that's okay for the garden, basically. Use that instead because it's nowhere near as harsh, but it will still do the job. You want to add in a few drops in whatever you're using it in because the main purpose of this is when you add a few drops of neem. And again, this was really irritating to me when I was first starting off because nobody was giving measurements. But I would say, okay, if you're doing a litre, maybe half a teaspoon of soap and half a teaspoon or maybe even a quarter teaspoon of the neem, 
And the reason why you're adding in the soap mainly is to help emulsify the neem into the water. And that's the other reason as well where you're adding warm water is to help with that emulsification just so that the oil doesn't sit at the very top of the water. It mixes up with the rest of the water and you can spray it. And obviously you can have it in a spray jar if you don't use all of it. Just remember before you use it, shake it up to kind of mix everything up again and then spray down basically. Because what will happen, even if it's emulsified, you might still get a layer of oil at the top, especially if it's been sitting there for a while. What you could also do is just use the soap with water and spray down your plants. If you don't want to use the neem oil, if you don't want to buy any neem oil, you could just do this as well. It does work in a similar way. So the soap, yes, it's helping with it. I'm emulsifying with the neem oil, but it also the soap does create a different action where if I'm not mistaken, it causes damage to the kind of outer shell of the bugs and ultimately it can kind of kill them off. So this is another one that you could just use the soap with the water in kind of similar quantities that I was talking about before and spray it down. You need to spray both the top side of the leaves and the bottom side of the leaves and the stems. And this pretty much applies to any form of spraying action for any of the pests basically. And touching again, finally, just to wrap up the spider mite section on air circulation. So air circulation, as I've mentioned at the beginning of this video will help because these aren't bugs necessarily that fly between plant to plant. These are definitely bugs that if you've got uh, foliage tusk touching, it will move across to a different plant. But I do find when I've got air circulation going around, they don't explode in population quite as easily. So moving on to mealybugs, and this is where you're gonna see me twitching because I've been dealing with mealybugs for nearly a year in this place. I've mentioned this in previous videos. Every time I've moved my plants around to different locations, I tend to have one predominantly powerful pest in that location. A few houses ago, it was spider mites. The house previous to this was thrips. <laughs> uh, glad I'm no longer there. And then in this house, it tends to be more mealybugs. So with the mealybugs, you can do several things to deal with them as well. And I've had varying levels of success with most of these things. I'll start off with the one that generally has the most amount of success is getting something like rubbing alcohol, having a little spray bottle and spraying down when you see the mealy bugs and using something like a Q-tip and actually scooping off what essentially at that point is kind of a dead carcass of a pest because what this does is it kind of dissolves them from the outside in, which been dealing with them for a long time, it's kind of really satisfying. Kind of bad, but kind of really satisfying at the same time. Um, this is the one that I've had the most amount of success when you spot individual mealybugs. And mealybugs are a type of pest that don't boom really quickly. I think one of the plants that tends to be a bit more predisposed to getting something like a mealybug is a lot of the citrus family if you're growing citrus indoors. Um, so bear that in mind. But the other thing I will say about mealybugs is you can get, and this is where the jar comes in again, you can get predatory biological control, so predatory insects for the mealybugs. Now what this looks like, and I don't know whether or not this is going to focus, it might do if I kind of like move my face out of it, you can maybe see it a tiny bit. It looks like a black ladybird or ladybug. And ladybirds or ladybugs will also, I think, will also target mealybugs. The problem that you get with a lot of these things, and this is the adult form of the biological control, you can and generally what you will get is the more juvenile form of this and you sprinkle it like a salt, salt, paper, salt shaker. The words are difficult today. So you sprinkle this as a salt shaker over the plant where there's mealy bugs and the kind of more juvenile form, the more larval stage of these predator bugs will then go and munch on the mealy bugs. Now, you can also get the adults and adults tend to be used more when you need immediate attention because there's a big infestation everywhere. The one thing I will say about the adults is they can fly. And they're very, very specific about the temperature requirements, but also they fly. So unless you can control your environment and have the windows and everything closed for a long period of time, the adults 
are tricky. At least they have been in my experience. The adults, technically you get the adults, they could also procreate and create more of the juvenile form, which would again eat the mealybugs. So you've got that as well. I mean, theoretically, if you're getting the juveniles, the same could happen. It would just take a bit longer. But things to remember with this, and I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I've got a lot of good air circulation. It affects the adults of this as well. It will make it harder for them to fly around as well. The other thing and the biggest negative for me is that the juvenile form of the mealybug, which is the one that you'll get most often, looks like a mealybug. Granted, there are some differences. Maybe I'm not finding them, but I find it exceptionally difficult to distinguish between the predator and the actual mealybug. I know it's slightly more spiky, still fluffy and white. <laughs> this is the thing. Um, but yeah, so that's a bit of a tricky one with me because a few weeks down the line, I'm just going to sit there. I've still got mealybugs. Do I need to kill them? But then do I not kill them because of these are predators? And am I killing the predators? <laughs> Cue the meltdown. <laughs> but um, yeah, that is another solution for them as well. The other thing that I found works really well and is surprisingly free is, especially if you've got a lot of mealybugs on a plant, is giving them a shower, taking them into the shower and giving them a spray down with a shower head or in the garden and the same thing, something that has got a bit of pressure to the water and it will knock off most of these bugs. Obviously there's a life cycle again here, so bear that in mind that you might need to set yourself a reminder to do it again in a couple of weeks time and then a couple of weeks after that as well, but you should get into a bit more control there. What you can also use, and I've done this and mixed success with this one is with the Castile soap in the warm water solution and the spray or the neem oil and the Castile soap in a warm water solution and spray and you can also add a tiny bit of rubbing alcohol. I'm not sure that that does an awful lot when there's a small amount of rubbing alcohol in that much water and soap and oil but I've seen it being said. It does okay obviously you'd spray the plant down on on the foliage, but with this one it tends to be more on the stems and the petioles and all the nooks and crannies because that's where the mealybugs generally will hide. Granted, I have also seen mealybugs on the actual foliage itself as well, so... <laughs> but um, yeah, you could also use this as well. As I said, it's been okay, it's not been great. The other thing to bear in mind, and these are going to be more honourable mentions, this it's part of the same family as the mealybugs. This is where the scale would come in and the scale is not fluffy mealybugs. I think they're very similar looking. They look, they've got more of a, like a hard shell and they will usually attach themselves to the stem or the petiole or the plant. Those can be quite tricky. As I've mentioned, I have never had those. So I can't talk from experience from what I have seen online is that you need to get underneath them and flick them off basically. So, the way that I would imagine them a bit is a bit like a limpet. So what you get at the sea that's attached to the rock, you want to get underneath it and flick it off basically. So there is that because that hard shell does protect it from quite a few things. One final little honourable mention, and again this is not something that I've experienced but I know some people have, is you can get root mealybugs. And I lie, I think maybe I've had it once. And this is, you will only ever see this if you're not seeing any pests on the outside. And I think root mealybugs can become regular mealybugs at some point. But you can get the mealybugs attaching themselves to the root of the plant. And then you can see the plant that might be in distress up at the top without actually having any visible pests on it. Just take it out of the pot before you start messing with the root and the root bowl too much. And check to see they look the same as they would do on the plant. So they're fluffy and white. Check that. I think in that situation, from what I keep seeing from people, you really don't have much of a choice. You do need to get rid of most of that soil media, try to have it under running water, try to get rid of as much of those root mealybugs as possible, and then repot and keep an eye on it basically. But there is that to bear in mind that you can also get root mealybugs. Moving on to white fly. And again, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I don't think there's an awful lot of people that go into too much detail with white fly and I've been dealing with them for a while now in here. I've got slightly confused and I still think it's white fly that I've got because I think the male form of a mealybug has got wings that looks a bit like a white fly. 
But um, if, even if it is that, they tend to have the same tendencies and I would imagine you would treat them in a very similar way. So something you might have never thought about seeing in a houseplant pest video is something like a vacuum or a handheld vacuum or anything like that. Because generally one of the best things I find to deal with white flies that will generally sit on the backside of the leaves is because every time you try to do anything with them they will fly away quite quickly. If you get a vacuum with a strong enough suction, obviously be very careful with your plants so you don't want to suction that in as well, but switching it on and kind of vacuuming around kind of in the air around those white flies will suck them all in basically and then you can just go and empty it out. Please do empty it out after you're done basically. You don't want them kind of living in your vacuum for however long. But yeah, that's one way to kind of really quickly get them off the leaves, basically. The other thing that has a very similar effect to things like fungus gnats is yellow sticky traps. So again, they will be attracted to the yellowness and then they'll go and stick to the trap. Obviously because white flies, as the name might suggest, they fly around. So things like air circulation going around, I find is really beneficial because they can't spread quite as easily because they can't really fly that well against the wind current that you might have that's kind of moving um, air around wherever you've got your plants. The other thing that you can do is obviously the same as with the spider mites is a solution of warm water, neem oil and the Castile soap and spray down the leaves. I haven't had that great success with this one but it is one of the things that people suggest that you do. And I'll throw a bit of a curveball into this as well. White flies or types of kind of um, cabbage butterflies is something that people have been dealing with in allotments, in vegetable gardening for a while. And the way that they tend to prevent it from happening is getting garden netting, the fine garden netting, and netting around where they've planted. I know this because I've only just done this at the allotment recently where I've put all the brassicas in because that's what they will be attracted to. But if you know for a fact that your plant hasn't got it and you know that they are buzzing around and you're really particularly worried about one of your plants, you could put a little net around it and enclose it. It doesn't look great, but also again, things with white flies, they do better in warmer environments anyway. So you'll see in the winter months, as long as your heating isn't too, too high and they haven't spread everywhere, then you can kind of deal with it that way by just putting a bit of a netting. It's not a permanent solution because it doesn't look that nice. It doesn't look that nice in the garden. It definitely won't look that nice in your house, but I will, I'm throwing that out there as a bit of a, <laughs> bit of a wild card. There is also biological control and this is what the biological control looks like. And essentially those are little eggs of a wasp and it's not a particularly big wasp and it won't harm you. You probably won't even see it, but this is a wasp that is attracted to white fly and what it will do is it will go onto the white fly and inject into the white fly their own babies, thus killing the white flies. And generally you might see a lot of the times white flies aren't mentioned as much because unless you've got a severe, severe infestation and they will probably get annoying to you as well, the damage that they'll do to the plant isn't particularly fast. What it might do for some plants that might be particularly slow growers, if you've got white fly on them, it will delay the growth even further. So just something to bear in mind, but yeah, you can also get predators for white fly. And finally, everybody's most hated pest, which is thrips. And hopefully if I've got a picture, I will add it here so you can see what a thrip looks like in, I think the picture that I would have is the larval stage. I'll see if I can get an adult picture and put it on there as well. But, and I think in the UK, I might be wrong with this, correct me if you're in the UK and you know that I am talking rubbish, but I think these are also things that you find outdoors as pests to plants outdoors here and they're called thunderbugs. Might be wrong. But the adult uh, form of this is almost looks like a black line it is particularly irritating and I find it really annoying when I'm outside, especially if there's loads of them buzzing around. I've got dark hair, they look a bit like a, they're thicker than a strand of hair, but they can easily go into your hair. They won't harm you, 
but it still get, gives me the ick, basically. So it's always like, ah, I need to jump in the shower and wash my hair off because just the thought of that just gives me the uh. uh. <laughs> but yeah, thrips are the one thing that most people, even the most seasoned of uh, houseplant owners will slightly kind of twitch at the thought of them because most of us have dealt with it. And if you haven't, I truly hope that you don't. Not to say that this isn't manageable and not to create panic. It can still be manageable. There are certain things that you can do to deal with thrips. I will tell you what has worked for me. It might not be to everybody's liking, but I will tell you what has worked for me. So the thing that has worked for me, and I've mentioned this on a previous video, is systemic bug spray and I've got the concentrate because at some point when I was dealing with a big infestation with this buying the bottles every time was getting really expensive so I got concentrate and in this one in the UK at least is called Provanto bug killer this is a systemic spray so that means several things so you would need to apply it spray it onto the plant you would spray down once the entire plant it needs to be dripping do this somewhere like in the bathroom that you can spray things down because you don't want to be getting this on your skin necessarily or breathing it in too much. It can be an irritant. It's the chemicals, people. But this, if I'm not mistaken with systemic, what it does happen is it kind of either gets incorporated into the plant through absorption or it kind of creates a bit of a layer on the outside and it stays there for a while and it basically harms the bugs that might be the pests that basically might be trying to grow on the plant specifically thrips basically this will deal with other things as well it says caterpillars black fly green fly white fly lily beetle there's a few things that it will deal with i've only really ever used this for thrips and this is the one thing that has worked for me now there's a few things to say about systemic sprays be very careful with this if you've got them outdoors and you're spraying it down because I'm pretty sure that will also kill off the good bugs. So things like butterflies and bees. So I wouldn't suggest that. There is a line of thought and people discussing that even if you're spraying it indoors, you might get it on you. You can might be transferring it outside as well. So there is that to consider as well. But it is the one thing that has worked for me. Be very, very diligent about reading on the life cycle of the thrips as well so this is one that might catch you because you might stop seeing them for like a couple of weeks or even a month and just go yay I no longer have thrips and then a couple of weeks later they're back again so this is one that I would normally whatever method I'm using will spray will spray again in two weeks will spray again two weeks after that and if I'm really feeling extra I might even spray two weeks after that as well now with anything like a systemic, this applies to most of the sprays, especially the things that are not just water that I've mentioned throughout this video. Do a little test on the back of one of the leaves of the plant that you're gonna spray down because some plants really don't like it on their leaves and it, you could damage the leaf itself as well. So it's a bit like if you're dyeing your hair, you do a strand test to see if there's gonna be any issues basically. Very similar to that, but yeah, spray it down, let it dry, drip dry, and then Ideally, and I've said that you can be a bit more flexible when it comes to things like isolating plants. This is the one thing that I will say if you can isolate, try to isolate. Um, if you've started to see it on multiple plants, it might be too late by that point to start isolating things because the adult form of this pest does fly and it does fly relatively well so it will travel between rooms as well at least it has done in my experience so something to bear in mind one of the other things that I have found can work this could be a bit more time consuming but if you've got a big plant and one that might not take to systemic sprays as well taking it into the shower and fully showering it down leaves stems petioles everything and doing that a few times, you might need to do it more times than you would be doing it with a traditional kind of bug spray. But that will also knock off mainly the eggs and the kind of larval stages of this. And these are the ones that will really do some damage to your plant. And you can usually see this as little kind of dugout sections on the leaves because the that's kind of how the little baby larva of the thrips kind of destroy the plant basically they kind of like 
dig into it to, I'm assuming, suck out some of the, the kind of phloem that's happening in the plant, and it can create a lot of stress to the plant. So bear that in mind. You can also use things like a neem spray. So again, I'll bring it up again. So the neem spray and the Castile soap in a mixture with some more water and spray it down. I have found this works sometimes. It doesn't always, always work. And again, it's very similar to just spraying it down with water. You need to kind of keep repeating this as well. And obviously with this, if you're spraying it, try to get some force in that spray to knock off whatever it is. Hopefully you're doing this either outside, as long as it's not systemic, or in the bathtub, basically. There are predators that will not exclusively target thrips, as far as I'm aware. They kind of tend to be a catch-all, and that is lace wings, green lace wings. And they will also target things like thrips. But they'll also target other types of pests as well. Lace wings are ones that, out of all the beneficial insects, are ones that you probably will notice flying around potentially as adults because they are relatively substantial. They won't harm you in any way or form. I think they also look a bit cute because their leaves, um, the green on their leaves does look a bit like a lace and the, the leaves are kind of, the leaves, the wings. Ah, oh, words are difficult today. Uh, the wings have got clear sections as well, almost like little windows, so it's kind of cute. But they will deal with that as well. But bear in mind, nothing holds true than what I was saying before. You need to give some time bef between kind of any form of chemical spray or organic spray onto the plants before you bring the beneficial insects, because it will kill off the beneficial insects before they've had a chance to do anything. And wrapping up what is an exceptionally long video, I'm looking at this and this might be one of my longest videos. If you have stayed until the very end, thank you. If you haven't, and you probably won't see this, but through the ether, thanks for staying for as long as you did. This is a very long video, <laughs> especially for one that I'm not showing you that many plants and I'm just talking about pests. But with the kind of concluding thoughts that I want to say with this is just a few things to remember again. Don't panic. Pests happen, pests will happen again. Pests will keep happening. You will never get rid of them entirely. You can manage the pests. Some pests will not harm your plants, but they might be irritating to you. There are always biological forms of control that you can use. It will be trial and error for most people. So I've talked about a whole host of different things on here. What worked for me in my environment with my care might not work for you in your environment and your care. Don't spend an awful lot of money buying all the extra bits and bobs. There are free versions if you want to try those first. And generally, just again, don't try to panic too much with this. I keep saying this again because this is the one thing that I keep seeing and I went through this as well in the beginning as well. I cannot tell you when I was first starting off, I used to have nightmares about pests in the summer where it was obviously playing on my mind too much. <sighs> You'll get there eventually, but it's it's a natural part of having houseplants. And it would be as well, even if they were outside as well in their natural environments. Try to enjoy it. Try to not let it get you down too much. And good luck with the battle. But yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. If you've got any comments you would like to leave, as always, please do down below. And yeah, have a great rest of the day. Thanks. Bye.